Hey, thank you guys for joining us today for uh, today's message. And we want to thank you for um, continuing to follow up with us and, and continuing to uh, be part of what we're doing here uh, it, it, with the youth ministry and these messages and these videos. And so thank you again for joining us and, and uh, taking part in these videos. And so if you want to join in our study today uh, along in your Bibles, we are going to be in James chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 10 today. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it, uh, James chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 10. And again, we read our passage, we pray, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So James chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, and, and then uh, we'll stop at verse 10. He says this, he says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, and mourn, and weep, and let your laughter be, tur be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. And humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. I'll read verse 10 again. It says this, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just want to thank You for giving us an opportunity to study Your Word today. We want to thank You for the power of Your Word. We, we know and recognize that it is only the Word of God that brings true transformation to hearts. And so we thank You that You've allowed us the privilege to, to study it. We thank You for for the honor of, of giving us the opportunity to even own Bibles and have Bibles in our home. And so we thank you for preserving your word all of these years and, and, and giving us a chance to study so that we can get to know you more fully, Lord. And so we pray that we would use this time to be uh, blessed by you. We pray that you would speak to us. And, and that is our great desire that we would hear from you, God. And so we thank you again for this day. We thank you for this time. We pray that we would give you our attention, our focus, and we pray that we would be willing and ready to submit to your word and, and always, Lord. And so we thank you again, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've been following along with us through the book of James, last week we began chapter 4, and we came to the eighth test of the book of James. If you remember, there's 13 tests that James presents to us through this book. And here we come to the eighth test. And we began that last week when we started chapter four. And what James began to do was he began to confront worldliness in the church. And we pointed out that James was directly addressing those in the church who were either visiting or passing by or just kind of unsure about, about the church. Um, but also he was addressing those who were making claims to be believers but actually they were not true believers. They were false converts. They were making professions of faith, but they still had a love for the world, which, as James told us last week, made them enemies of God. So, so this meant that they were false Christians. They were not true um, regenerated Christians because they continued to have a love for the world. If you remember last week, back in verse uh, 4, I'm sorry, in verse 6, James said that whoever wishes to make himself, I'm sorry, go back in verse 4 of um, the beginning of chapter 4. James says, whoever wishes to make himself a friend of the world has made himself an enemy of God. And then in verse 6, um, we ended last week with James exhorting those people in the church to give up their pride and to humbly come to God. And so he said in verse 6, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's where we ended last week. As a matter of fact, James refers to it as a greater grace. He gives a greater grace to those who, uh, who come to him in humility. Throw away your pride and come to God in humility. And, and so that's what we were looking at last week in verses 1 through 6. We were looking at James confronting the worldliness in the church. And so we pick it up here in verses 7 through 10. James is still speaking to unbelievers, and he says to them, Submit to God, resist the devil, and draw near to God. 
And then he goes on with seven more imperatives, letting the unbeliever know how they're supposed to respond to the call of God. And so we understand that God has, has called his people and the Holy Spirit comes to us and it brings conviction to us. And this allows us to respond to God. And so we understand that the scripture says that salvation is of God. We know that. We, we, we read our Bibles. We understand that that's what the Bible says. Ephesians 1, 4 says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Salvation is of God. We know that. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, God has chosen you from the beginning to be saved by the sanctification of the Spirit and by faith in the truth. And then 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but by His own purpose and by the grace He granted us in Christ Jesus before time eternal. And so the Bible tells us that salvation is of God. God has, has chosen us. He's, he's, he's desired for his children to come out of the world and be his children. We know that. But we also know that God says after we hear his calling, after we've received the, the conviction of the Spirit, after the conviction of the Spirit has begun to take place in our heart and the Holy Spirit is, is, is ministering to us, then we have a responsibility to respond to God. And that's what it tells us in Acts 17.30. God says, it says, God is now, sorry, this is Luke writing in Acts. He says, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. This is the response. This is my response. This is your response. Our human response is to respond, to repent, to do something in response to the call of God. Second Peter verses, uh, chapter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is our response. We hear the call of God and now we respond to him. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants. Notice he says your responsibility is to choose. And he says, choose life that you may live. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Notice, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. This is your response. This is my response. And so, yes, we, we, we understand that God has called his people and, and salvation is a work of God. But we un understand as well that in that calling, we have a responsibility to respond to God. And so we have this duality in salvation that God saves us, God calls us, but it's our responsibility to respond to that call and repent and believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. And so today, we're going to look at what this response looks like. What does, what is my job? What is your job? When we hear the call of God, when we feel the call of God um, in our heart, when the Holy Spirit has begun that work in our heart, what is my response? What is your response supposed to be? And remember, um, for, for those of us who are already Christians, this is what we should be doing. These things that we're going to talk about here in these four verses, these are the things that we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. This is our life. But in the passage specifically that we're looking at, remember in verses 1 through 6, James is talking to unbelievers in the church. And so here in verse 7 through 10, continuing on speaking to them, because he's still talking to them. This is the same day, this is the same message, this is the same instruction an exhortation. So James still speaking to unbelievers, what he's doing is, is he's calling on the unbeliever to get right with God. 
And this is what he's doing here in verses 7 through 10. Yes, for us Christians, we should be doing these things as well. But specifically in the context that we're looking at here, James is speaking to unbelievers and he's saying, come to God, do these things, respond to the call of God. And this is what we're looking at in our passage today. So the thought of our passage for today is this. When God calls us to himself, our responsibility is to respond. He then gives us the spirit to live out the things that he's called us to do. Again, when God calls us to himself, our responsibility is to respond. He then gives us the spirit to live out the things that he's called us to do. So God calls us, we respond to him, and when we respond to him in the way that we are supposed to, and we'll look at that, then he will give us his Holy Spirit, and when we receive the Spirit, we will have the power of God to live out the things that he has called us to do. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that we were created to do good works. And so when we receive the Spirit of God, we will have the power to fulfill that work that God has created us to do. And so this can only happen if we respond to the calling of God. And so what we're going to look at here in these four verses, and again, don't, don't get intimidated by this, but we're going to look at um, 10 ways that we respond to the, the calling of God, or 10 ways that we respond to God's call. And of course, we, we can't go into a comprehensive um, examination of every single one of these in depth because each one probably could be its own uh, message. And so we're going to mention it, look at the passage, and then say some things about it um, to, to relate it to what's going on in our passage today. But we're going to look at 10 ways that we respond to God's call. And, and I'll mention them to you uh, here, and then we'll go through them uh, through the rest of our study. So 10 ways. Number one, we submit to God. Number two, we resist the devil. Number three, we have fellowship with God. Number four, we have to clean up our act. Number five, purify your heart. Number six, hate your sin. Number seven, mourn your actions. Number eight, shed tears when you sin. Number nine, change your attitude. And number 10, be humble. And so this is what we're looking at today, 10 ways that we respond to God's call. The first one that we uh, mentioned here is the first thing that we do in responding to God's call is we first submit to God. Notice here in verse 7, James says, Submit therefore to God. This word submit is the Greek word hupotasso, which is a military term meaning to come under rank. And the idea, of course, it is that no one can be saved without first coming under the rank of God or submitting to God. And this is a willful submission to the sovereign authority of God. This means that we submit to his word and his will. We cannot receive Jesus as Savior if we do not submit to him as Lord. And that's an important distinction that we need to make. We cannot say, well, God is my Savior if we don't obey what he says. That's what Jesus says countless times throughout the Gospels. If you love me, then you will obey my commandments. If you love me, then you will do what I say. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, John says, If you call yourself a Christian, then walk like Jesus walked. And so these are, these are strong words from, the, from, from Jesus, and these are strong words from the Apostle John, because it's important, it's weighty, and it should be. It should be what God has called us to. We should have a desire to serve Him. We should have a desire to submit to Him. And so if, if all we're trying to do is, is get a get-to-heaven free pass, then that's not um, making Jesus Lord. That's not making God Lord. We're just we're, we're, What we're actually doing is making an idol of heaven and saying, I want heaven more than I want God. And obviously, you can understand that that is wrong. You have to want God more than you want anything else. And so we submit to God. That's the first thing we have to do, is in our response to God's call, we must submit to the authority of God. He has to be your everything, or you have revealed him to be your nothing. 
In Titus chapter 2, verse 9, the word submit, it's used to describe the relationship between a slave and a master. And it is in this sense that we submit to God. Whatever he says, we do. Whatever his word says, we obey. And that's important for us to understand because a lot of times we'll look at our Bibles and we'll see something in the scripture that, that, that for us when we read it, we say, man, that's hard to do. Oh, be loving to your enemies? That's hard to do. Oh, be forgiving to the person who's, who's uh, done something to you? Oh, that's hard to do. Oh, be kind to all people? That's hard to do. And frankly, God is not concerned about whether it's hard or not hard. He simply says, do it. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, when God has empowered you with the power of his Holy Spirit, then you have the ability to do it if you draw strength from God. If you're drawing on your own strength, then of course you're going to fail. But when we draw strength from God, then we have the power of God, the power of the Spirit, to do the things that He's told us to do. And so the things that are difficult, yes, they're difficult, but God has strengthened us to do what He has commanded us to do. And so we submit to His Word, we submit to His will. Whatever He has planned for my life, I have to say, thank you, God, that you're working in me. And I submit, whatever it is, whatever you want me to do, then I will do it. And you have to be willing to, to say that. And not say it, but mean it. And so God says, before you can do anything else, you first have to submit to God. You have to submit. And, and again, I make mention the submission relationship is slave to master, slave to master, master to slave. We are slaves to Christ. That's just, that's the way the Bible describes it. And we don't sugarcoat it and call it any other thing. That is the relationship. We are slaves of Christ. And we have to understand something before we move on to the next section. We have to understand that the scripture tells us that all of us are slaves to something. We're either a slave to, to Satan, to the lordship of Satan in, the, in this world, in the system of the world, or we are a slave to righteousness in Christ. And God says there is no uh, in-between, there is no, no um, other option, there is no third option. You're either a slave to Satan or you're a slave to God. And so he says, James is saying, submit to God. Don't submit to Satan, submit to God. God. And so the first response to God's call is, is that we must submit, therefore, to God. When we become a child of God, it is because we, because we have submitted ourselves coming under the authority and the coming under the rank of God, recognizing He is up here and I am down here. He has top rank and I have bottom rank. I, I rank way below God. And we have to recognize that and say, because I'm down here and he's up here, then I have to obey him. I have to submit to him. Because that's what's right. And that is the first response to, to the call of God is we submit to God. Secondly, here in verse 7, he says, um, submit therefore to God. And then he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So number two, the second thing we must do is resist the devil. The word resist literally means to stand against or oppose. This is the idea, um, the idea being that there is no middle ground or no neutral stance. We must resist the devil. We must oppose the devil and his worldly system. And James has already alluded to this in our study of last week. I remember in verse, um, verse 4, he said that if you wish to make yourself a friend of the world, then you make yourself an enemy of God. If you wish to make yourself a friend of the world, then you make yourself an enemy of God. So we cannot have a neutral stance against evil. We must 
stand against evil and, and not only stand against it, but we must strongly oppose it. And there should be no, no uh, question in anyone's mind that a Christian opposes evil. And so I recognize that in our day and age, things are so confusing to the worldly person because the Bible tells us that as we get closer to the return of Christ, that people are going to call um, evil good and good evil. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So we will say, I want to go to church. I think that's good. I think that's right. But the worldly person will say, you wanting to go to church is evil. And, and so we have this this whole thing going on in society where the worldly people are calling the good things evil and the and the evil things good and then we have the christian calling the truly good good and the truly evil evil and there just seems to be a lot of confusion about what's going on and so for the christian there should be no doubt that we oppose evil we stand against evil we must strongly oppose it and so he says resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil is the Greek word diabolos, which means slanderer or accuser. And according to scripture, the devil, he's the father of, of so many in this world. In John 8, 44, Jesus says this, anyone who does not belong to Christ is a child of the devil. Now understand that. If you are not a child of God, Jesus said to the religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil. And a lot of people, they would not uh, want to accept that title for themselves. Some of you might be thinking about um, these different celebrities, right? We have musicians, we have actors and actresses and athletes that are so worldly, extremely worldly. During this um, whole thing that's been going on the last uh, week or so or two weeks, we have celebrities that are giving their own money to bring people out of jail who were committing crimes against other people. That's, that's wrong. That's evil. And what the Bible says is that the devil is their father because they're not of God. And if you are not of God, then you are of the devil. He is your father. John 8, 44. Anyone who does not belong to Christ is a child of the devil. And so we have these athletes that's, that, that maybe you look up to. And because they're worldly, not child uh, or children of God, they actually are children of Satan. And, and we wouldn't want to say that out loud. We wouldn't want to say that to their face, but the reality is that the scriptures say that that's what they are. Satan, or the devil, is the ruler of this world. To some, he is the master. To the believer, he is a former master. And when we submit to God, the devil was no longer in control. And notice what he says here, what James says. He says, um, that just as the devil left Jesus after the temptations in the wilderness, it says that he will flee from those who resist him. And so this is a promise from God that we don't have to be ruled by temptations, that we don't have to be ruled by the devil. And this is why it's important to put on the armor of God that Paul mentions in Ephesians 6. We resist the devil with our sword of the spirit and we watch him flee from us because the spirit of God is way more powerful than any um, than any weak little power that Satan might have. And it's weak in comparison to God. We don't test Satan. Satan is more powerful than us. But he is nothing compared to God. In comparison to God, he is weak. Very weak. And so when we yield the, the sword of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is being used against the devil, then we have victory. And so we must remember to, to, to wear the, the armor of God. Read Ephesians 6 and, and, and familiarize yourself with the pieces. But we battle with the Spirit. We battle with the Word. 
And that's how we defeat the devil. And then we make him run from us. Satan will flee. The devil will flee from us if we oppose him with the word of God. If we strongly oppose, uh, if we strongly oppose the devil using the power of the Spirit, the word of God, then he will flee from us. He will run away. And so that's the second response. After we submit to God, then we resist and oppose the devil. Third, here in verse 8, he says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And this is a speaking of fellowship with God. And so this is the third response. The third response is that we must have fellowship with God. We submitted, we resisted the devil, and now we draw near to God. This speaks of having a close, intimate relationship with God. When we get saved, we become children of God. And we should desire to know everything that we can about our Heavenly Father. I want to know more of Him. I want to hear from Him. I want to know about Him. And this can only happen when we come to God. When we draw near to God. And so the Jews... They understood this. One of the primary responsibilities of the Old Testament priests was specifically to come near to God. That's what their responsibility was. Exodus 19.22, um, Leviticus 10.3, Ezekiel 43.9. These verses speak of the priest coming near to God. And so in the Old Testament, the expression drawing near to God, it referred to to an approachment or approaching God in humility and sincerity. They, They sincerely in humility came to approach God. The priest did. And, and what James is saying here, that we must approach God in that same attitude, seeking fellowship, that we want to draw near to God. And so not only is it our responsibility to come to him, come to church, read your Bible, fellowship with other Christians, um, be in prayer. These are ways that we draw near to God. These are ways that we have fellowship with God. And this is the amazing thing. This is the thing that's beautiful about this. When we draw near to him, he doesn't play hard to get. He doesn't hide himself up in an ivory tower. In fact, he does quite the opposite. We show a desire to get closer to him, and then he responds by getting closer to us. Now, can you imagine? God is perfect. God is holy. God is infinite. God is omnipotent. And and all of these wonderful attributes and characteristics, why would he want to get close to me, a sinner? Why? I don't know. But the Bible says that when we draw near to him, then he will draw near to us. In Psalm 145, verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him. 1 Chronicles 28, 9 says, If you seek Him, then He will let you find Him. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, You will seek Me and you will find Me when you search for Me with all your heart. That's a beautiful thing. That we can come um, looking for God, that we will draw close to God. And, and not only is He there, but He will in turn draw Himself close to us, that He will come to us. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Remember when the son finally comes to his senses and then he makes his way back home to ask forgiveness for his father or to ask forgiveness of his father? Um, do you remember what happens? So remember, the son takes his inheritance, he, he shames the family, he goes out and he squanders all the money, he, he's living loosely and living wildly, wildly and doing all of these things that you shouldn't be doing, living in the world. And then he realizes, he, when he finds himself eating with the pigs, he says, what am I doing? Why did I leave my home? Why did I leave my family? The Spirit of God had brought conviction in that story, and he says to him, um, or he says to himself, I have to go back home. I have to apologize to my father. I have to say I'm sorry 
so I can come back to the family. And, and, and what happens when the son starts making his way towards the father, when he starts making his way back home? In Luke chapter 15, verse 20, it says this, But while his son was still a long way off, while the son was still far away, right? It says that his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him that he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. You understand that? When the son began to draw near to the father, the father didn't only um, allow himself to be approached by the son, he ran to the son. He ran to him and he threw his arms around him because he loved him and he, and he felt compassion on him and he kissed him. God desires fellowship with his children. He doesn't withhold himself from us. He's not hiding from us. He wants us to come to him so that he can come closer to us. If we seek God, then he will make himself known. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. This, this brings up a, a quick point before we move on. If you're not growing in your relationship with the Lord, if you're not falling deeper in love with God and his word and his ways and his people, it's not because of God. It's because of us. Because he makes this promise that if we draw near to him, then he will draw near to us. And so if he's not drawing near to us, guess what that means? That means that we're not drawing near to him. We're not doing our part in getting to know him. And so this third response to the calling of God is that we must have fellowship with him. We must draw near to God. And we have the beautiful promise that if we draw near, then he will make himself known. And even more than that, he will run to you and he will throw his arms on you because he has compassion on his people and he will kiss you. Because he loves us. And it's because that is who he is. Because he is love and he loves his children. And so this brings us to the fourth response. The fourth response we see here in verse 8, after, he, after James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And so the fourth thing that we see is that we need to clean up our act. Cleanse your hands. The idea of cleansing, again, it comes from a Jewish ceremonial laws for the priest. Before they, before they approached the Lord, they had specific rules for cleansing. The cleansing of the hands was symbolic of washing yourself of sin. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says this. It says, your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight and cease to do evil. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. The call to cleanse your hands is the call to stop doing evil. And then notice James refers to them as you sinners. This is a title that's never given to a born-again Christian in the Bible. We are all sinners, right, in a, human, in a human perspective in regards to humanity. Yes, of course, we understand that we are all sinners. We acknowledge that. The Apostle Paul makes that very clear in Romans chapter 3. Um, what does he say? All, all, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who does good. There is none who seek God. Yes, this is true. In a human sense, yes, we are all sinners. But to the Corinthians, Paul says, such were some of you. This isn't who you are anymore. You are new creatures. You are new creations. So the fact that James was calling these who he was addressing sinners, it, it makes it pretty clear that he's speaking to the unbeliever. And he's urging them, come to God, respond to God. You feel the Spirit working. You, you hear the call of God, respond to him. 
And just to make this clear before we move on, Christians are still sinners. We still sin. We don't have um, Joyce Meyer theology who, who thinks that she's, um, you know, attained righteousness and she doesn't sin anymore. We, we don't believe that. Um, the Bible tells us clearly we're still sinners. Read uh, Romans chapter 7 where Paul says that he desires to do good, but he continually uh, does bad. And he does the things that he hates, even though he wants to do uh, the things that he loves. I want to live for God. I want to obey God. And instead, I keep finding myself doing the things that I hate. That's a Christian. Yes, we, are, we still sin. We're still sinners uh, because we still have a sinful flesh. But we are never labeled as sinners in the scriptures in regards to a new, being a new creation. The, the Bible never labels new believers and, and Christians. Uh, he, he, it never labels them as sinners. And so the fact that James is referring to them as sinners indicates that he's speaking to those who are still unsaved. And so, yes, we're still sinners, but that is not a title that has been given to us once we become born again. James here, speaking to a group of you sinners, speaking to unbelievers, and he's urging them, turn to God, come to God, respond to God's call. And so the, the fifth response to the call of God that we see here, he says, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so the fifth response is purify your heart. Purify your heart. And so these are parallel phrases to what he, he said just a second ago there in verse, in, in verse 8. Purify your heart is very similar to cleanse your hands in the same way that you sinners is very similar to double-minded. It, it's, it's important to note that where cleansing your hands is an outward expression, purifying your heart is an inward expression. So to fix your behavior externally first uh, requires that we address the issue internally. This is why we've heard this so many times, that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We've heard this countless times. You're never going to have clean hands if you don't have a pure heart. This is what the real issue is. And it's... And it's uh, it reminds me of kind of what we're dealing with right now in society, right? We have this whole issue of racism and this this hot topic and this 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 issue that people are are talking about right now. And people are trying to figure out how do we deal with this problem? Is it more laws? Is it less laws? Is more awareness? Is it more money? Is it protests? And get this, is it Instagram posts? I don't know how um Instagram posts have become a way and solution for, for, uh, for racism. I don't, I don't understand that. Um, but how do we solve this problem? Well, the only way it's going to be addressed externally is when it is addressed in the heart first. It must be addressed internally. If you want real change, then you need a change of heart. And the only way that this happens is when God takes away your heart of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. You must have your heart purified. Christ is the only solution. And so we have a, a very easy solution. You want real change? Your heart needs to be changed. That's the solution. And obviously, a lot easier said than done, right? It's a lot harder to accomplish than, than just saying it. But we know the solution. Hearts need to be changed. How do we fix uh, the, the, the society? How do we fix the country? How do we fix all of these issues? Well, one, we're never going to fix it. It's only God who can. And two, it has to be addressed in the heart. It cannot be addressed by, by legislation. It cannot be addressed with money. It cannot be addressed with protests. It cannot be addressed in any external form. The only way you bring real change is through the heart. Purify your heart. And again, indicating that he's speaking to unbelievers, James refers to them as double-minded. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, James refers to the double-minded as being unstable in all their ways. The phrase double-minded, it literally means double-souled. 
This is the person who says one thing, but they live out another. In, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. You cannot have two masters. You cannot serve two different people or two different systems. And so the fifth response to God's call is to stop being double-minded. Commit yourself to God that your heart may be purified. Our hearts need to be changed. The world's hearts needs to be changed. If we want any type of external change, if we want better behavior, if we want better rules, better laws, better this, better that, anything externally, it first has to be addressed in the heart. And we know that it can only happen through the power of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the solution. And so what is the sixth response to to the call of God. Well, the sixth response here is in verse 9, and, and for the next uh, couple of sections, we're going to look at just one word responses. And this is what he says here in verse 9. Be miserable. And so the sixth response is this. Hate your sin. When we come to God, when we respond to the call of God, we must hate our sin. The Greek word translated miserable, it carries the idea of being broken because of your circumstances. And in this case, it's being sinful, lost, and separated from God. When we have our eyes open to the reality of our own sin, it should make us feel miserable, knowing that that's who we are. We're bad. We're wretched. We're sinners. And we are um, depraved. In Jeremiah, it, in Jeremiah chapter 17, it tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Think about that. Our hearts are desperately wicked. We are sinful. And when we realize how sinful we are, it should crush us. It should make us crumble. It should make us hate our sin. And this is what James is saying. This is why it's so important when you're evangelizing that you paint a clear picture of who God is and who we are. Listen, God is perfect. There is no blemish in him, no spot. He's perfectly holy. And here we are dirty, unholy, unrighteous. And when we understand that sin is the reason that Jesus went to the cross, and look, it's not sin in some idea, abstract way. I'm talking about my sin. I'm talking about your sin. It's our real sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was because of me that he had nails driven in his hands and feet. It was because of you that he had a crown of thorns put on his head. It was because of our sin that Christ was nailed to the cross. And when we, when we see that, when we recognize that and realize that, we should be crushed. It should make us feel terrible. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that it, was, that it was our sorrows that Jesus carried. It said that our grief he bore. Listen, he was pierced because of our transgressions and he was crushed because of our iniquities. When we understand the weight of our sin, it should make us feel miserable. When we see the, the result of that, as we look on the, the blood-stained cross. My, my boys, you guys know, my boys, Ezekiel, Adam. When Ezekiel gets in trouble, uh, Kimmy will spank him. And he'll cry, obviously, because that's what kids do when you spank them. And when Ezekiel's not listening, which he doesn't a lot, because this boy likes spankings, when he's getting a spanking, Sometimes Adam will cry. And Adam cries because he sees the, the pain that his brother is having to go through. When we see the pain that Jesus had to endure because of us, it should make us hate our sin because it was our sin that put him on the cross. 
This is true of my own conversion. As I sat on the floor that evening in tears, realizing that it was my sin that caused so much pain to the people that I love. And not only to, to, to the people, but also to God. And I couldn't do anything else but ask God to rid me of that guilt. I had been crushed by the weight of my own sin. When I said, I never thought that I could do this. I never thought that this would be me. The, the weight of sin just crushed me. And I said, God, help me. God, change me. And it was in that moment that I began to hate my sin. And because God had opened my eyes to the destruction of sin, now I said, I, I don't want to have any part to do with sin. And then we go about our lives fighting the, the lust of the flesh, the, the, the pride of life, and, and, and the Spirit of God enables us to have victories over those things. And, and in those moments where we still commit sin, because we do, because we're human, we should hate it. We should say, I, I hate that I committed this sin. And so James says, be miserable about your sin. The next thing, this is number seven, he says, be miserable and mourn. And so the seventh response to God's call is mourn your actions. We should be mourning our actions, our sinful actions, okay? When we respond to the, call, to the call of God, we should be mourning our sinful deeds. The word mourn, it speaks of deep grief and remorse, deep despair. This is talking about the attitude the repentant sinner has towards their sinful actions. We should be in deep grief about our sin. But notice something here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we come to the Lord in despair regarding our sin, then He will comfort us with promises. We come to God and we say, God, I feel terrible that I committed this sin. I feel terrible that I said this lie. I feel terrible that I did such a thing. And God says, Don't forget about my promises. Don't forget about my word. He is here to comfort his children. When we mourn our sin, when we, when, we, um, when we are in deep grief about the things that we've done against God, our offenses against him, then he is there to comfort us with his promises. The promise of eternal life in heaven with him, the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit, he promises close fellowship with himself. He promises peace and joy and power. Our sin causes grief, but God provides comfort. And I would suggest to you that this is as important as it is in conversion, that we should continue to do this daily as seasoned Christians. We should never be okay with sin. We should never say, well, it was just one sin. It was just a, a small thing that we did. We should be crushed always with any sin that we commit, recognizing that it only took one sin to put Jesus on that cross, because it is only one sin that separates the, the person from God for all eternity. It's not one little sin. It was sin that put Christ on the cross. Recognize that. Understand that. And then you will begin to understand the weight of how wicked and destructive sin is. And when we, when we see that, when our eyes are open to that, we will be miserable about our sin and we will mourn our sin. It should always cause us to be remorseful. It's been said that Christians never sin successfully. And that doesn't mean that, that Christians are always getting caught with everything that they do. They, they might not get caught in a, in, a, in a physical sense, but God knows. And because God knows, listen, you know as well. And so what happens is, is that when you commit a sin and you're hiding from God and you're doing things in secret and you're doing things in hiding and in darkness, your conscience will begin to, to eat you up. And then what happens a lot of times is, is the Christian uh, will start to suppress, 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 and say, conscience, shut up. Conscience, get away from me. God says, don't do that. 
the conscience bringing, bringing up this guilt and bringing up this shame is good because it leads us to repentance. It should lead us to say, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, forgive me for my sin. And so just as important as it is when you're a, a, a brand new Christian responding to the call of God for the very first time, it, it, it's equally important for the seasoned Christian to continually be in mourning over their own sin and say, God, I don't want to be part of this. Take all of this away from me. I want to be pure for you. The eighth thing, the eighth response to God's call is here in verse 8 as well. He says, or I'm sorry, verse 9. In verse 9, he says, be miserable. And then he says, and mourn. And then thirdly, and weep. Shed tears when you sin. That's the eighth response to God's call. Shed tears when you sin. This is an outward manifestation of the previous two attitudes. When we feel miserable and in despair over our sin, it often results in tears. Remember when Peter told Jesus that he would never deny him. Remember what happened when Peter was confronted about Jesus after he was arrested? The, the, the lady comes up and says, Were you with that guy, that Galilean? And Peter says, no way, I don't, even, I don't even know who that guy is. I don't even know his name. He didn't even want to say his name. He says, I don't know that man. And, she, and then, uh, sorry, not Jesus, Peter. Peter denies knowing Jesus. Not once, not twice. He denies him three times. And then what happened to Peter? Well, he was overcome by his misery. He was overcome by despair of his own sin. And then Mark tells us in Mark 14, 72, it says that Peter began to weep. Peter began to weep. He began to shed tears because he recognized that he was sinful. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, 28, My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. This doesn't mean that if you don't shed a tear, you're not really saved. This doesn't mean that you have to cry to have a real, a real salvation. This is not what it means. James is talking about the attitude of the heart. Is your heart weeping because of your sin? Are you in mourning? Are you in misery because you hate your sin? Because you recognize and realize what your sin has cost Jesus. It cost him his life. And so what he's talking about specifically, he's talking about an attitude of the heart. But we know that, that this type of grief and despair is often um, responds in a physical reaction of, of actual tears. People cry because they realize, man, what did I do to God? It was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. This brings us to the ninth point. He says, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. I've, I've labeled this section here, this ninth response, change your attitude. And, and, and so let me explain. First, let me tell you what James is not saying. He's not saying that we should never have laughter and that we should never have joy. God is the author of laughter and joy. And so what he's doing here is he's building off the attitudes in verse 9 of misery, mourning, and weeping. And the laughter and joy that he's speaking about here is referring to, to, to worldly, self-centered happiness about, about sin. Now, before you, became, be, before you became a Christian, you remember how much fun you thought you were having when you were committing sin with all of your friends? I, I think about the places that I've hung out with with some of my friends. Places that we used to go to, uh, hangouts at friends' houses, different opportunities that we had where, where a bunch of people were together and there's an excess of alcohol and there's vulgar language and there's um, desires of the flesh and there's all of these different things going on. And, and, and one thing stands out when you're in these, um, in this atmosphere, in these environments is everyone is just laughing and, and, and supposedly being happy and having joy. And, and there's so much laughter in the room and they are giving no thought to the fact that they are committing so much sin. All it is is laughter. And in their perspective, all it is is joy. No one caring about the sin they're committing. No one giving a second thought to what's right and wrong. In their mind, in my mind, we were just having fun. We were filled with joy. And James is saying, 
Turn that laughter into mourning. Turn that joy into gloom because there isn't anything funny about your sin. There isn't anything funny about your sin. My sin, your sin, sin in general. There is nothing funny about sin. And so James is saying, stop laughing. Take away this worldly joy and turn it into mourning. Turn it into gloom because you are in sin. And when we respond to God, we realize, what am I laughing about? I am sinful. Why why do I have this worldly joy? This is not real joy. I, I am gloomy now because I recognize the weight of my sin. I realize now the things I was doing, those things were so dumb. When we respond to God's call, our attitude towards sin should change. Luke 6.45 says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And that was me, man. Woe to me, because I was laughing then, and then I got to the point where I was mourning and weeping. And you might think that it's all fun and games now. You might think little sin is not a big deal, and you're, and you're living it up, and you're having the time of your life, and there's a lot of laughter and joy in your perspective. But guess what? The time will come where there will be mourning and weeping. And, and responding to God's call, our, our attitude to sin and worldly pleasures, they should change. And this is what James is saying. Our, our attitude should change. We should have a change in attitude towards sin. No longer do I want to take part in it. No longer do I want to be around it. I don't even want to hear about it. Take me away from it. I want to honor God. I want to live for God. I want to stay away from sin because I recognize it was sin that put Christ on the cross. And then the last response here in verse 10, he says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. The last response to the calling of God is be humble. When God calls us, we need to be humble. This phrase, humble yourselves, it literally means to make low, to make yourself low, to make oneself low. Now, this doesn't mean, listen, this doesn't mean that we put ourselves down in hopes that others will lift us up. That's not what he's talking about. And I see that a lot especially on social media, people that put themselves down in order that other people around them will lift them up. Christians talking about how hard it is to be a Christian so that other people will write nice comments on their posts so that they can make them feel better. This is called fishing. Fishing for compliments, fishing for encouragement, fishing for nice words. What you're doing is fishing. And some people are really good uh, at fishing. Stop fishing. That's not humility. That's not what, what James is talking about. That's not what the scriptures call on us to do. I see a lot of, a lot of um, girls do this, fishing, talking about their insecurities, talking about their sadness, talking about the difficulties of life. And then at the end, they, you know, they'll post like this really long thing. And then at the very end, it'll be like a, a, a one sentence thing. But God is good and I trust him. Well, you just complain for like all of this whole thing. Stop complaining. Stop complaining so that a bunch of people would just make you feel better. I see a lot of moms do this, actually. They post about how hard some moment of their day was because their kid did this or their kid did that. And, and, and what they're looking for is for people to respond to them to say, way to go, mom, you're doing great. Don't worry, you're a great mom anyway. And, and do all of the, and you're, you know, you're great, you're awesome. God loves you. He's, you're doing fine. They're just looking for words of affirmation. They're just looking for positive words. And look, there's nothing wrong with with receiving encouragement. There's nothing wrong with receiving um, positive affirmation. There's nothing wrong with people around you being positive. But there is something wrong when you're going out looking for it. And that's what James is saying. Don't go out there looking for it. And, And when I see these things, they frustrate me because I know what you're doing. People know what you're doing. You're trying to disguise your complaining while hoping that someone's gonna is going to give you something that lifts you up. And that's not true humility. Humbling yourself in the presence of the Lord is coming to God, realizing that you are completely unworthy of being in his presence because of the magnitude of your sin. That's true humility. This is Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 when he says, Woe is me, for I am ruined. 
I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. True humility is Peter in and, and Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when Peter says, Go away from me, my Lord, for I am a sinful man. He wasn't looking for Jesus to say anything in return. He wasn't looking for a pat on the back. He wasn't looking for a nice comment. He was simply saying, God, I'm unworthy. And that's the attitude that we need to approach God with. God, I'm unworthy. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for using me. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your family. And, and James says that when we humble ourselves, then God will exalt us. Ephesians 2 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 7 and 8 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Rest assured that when we approach God in lowliness, then he will lift us up. Come to God in lowliness and, and, and know that he will raise you up. Don't do it on yourself. Don't seek it out. Have a true heart of humility and you will see God exalt you. And so James presents these 10 responses to God's call as a means to evangelize the unbeliever in the church. And today I present them to you for the same reason, to urge you to respond to God's call. The Bible says, Today is the day for salvation. Joshua told the people, choose today whom you will serve. And James said, if you love the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And today, if you are not submitting to Christ as Lord, then the judgment of God is upon you. That's what the Bible tells us. If you have refused and rejected God, then the judgment of God is on you. The Bible tells us that there will come a day when God will judge all of us for our sin. And we are all sinners and we are all guilty and we all need to pay. But God and God says blood needs to be shed. That payment for sin is blood. It has to be bloodshed. So what does God do? He says, I will shed the blood of my own son. He will offer himself in your place. And if you believe in him, then your debt will be forgiven. And when I look at you, no longer am I going to see a sinful, dirty, wicked person, but I will see the righteousness of my own son. We can be made right in the eyes of God when we repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And so I call on you today, submit to the Lord, flee from the devil, and draw near to God and watch as he runs towards you. That's his promise. Leave the world, leave the lust, leave the desires, submit to the Lord, and he will run to you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to study. We want to thank you for the power of your word. We want to thank you for changing lives. Thank you for changing my life. And so I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your patience that you that you um, had the patience to save me, that you didn't return or take me out of this earth before I gave my life to you. So I pray that we would be pleasing to you, that you would strengthen us by the power of your spirit to live a life that brings you honor. And so we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. And we pray that we would bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And so we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.